Uh, for the record, could you please state your name and the position in your company or the organization that you represent? Uh, Ruslan Dinichenko, Stop Fake from Ukraine. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, the, the evidence that you'll be giving today before the committee will be taken on oath. So if you so desire, you can make an affirmation. Clerk of Parliament, please proceed with the oath. I, Ruslan Dinichenko, do solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence which I shall give before this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Please be seated. Welcome to the public hearing of the Select Committee. And the focus for today's evidence gathering is for us to pose questions to you. And you have taken a solemn obligation to answer our questions truthfully. And I will now call upon uh, Mr. Pritam Singh. Uh, good morning, Mr. Dinichenko. Thank good you morning. for your submission to uh, to the Select Committee. Uh, what I will do is I will go through your submission uh, just to have it on the record, and uh, I would appreciate it if you reply yes or yes or correct uh, after I go through your okay. uh, particular uh, statement. Okay. I refer to the first page of your your submission. Uh, and you confirmed that Stop Fake was founded on in March of 2014 as a volunteer project of a small group of Ukrainian journalists. Yes. The main goal of the project was to stop the spread of foreign propaganda and mi minimize its influence on Ukrainian society. Yes. And I go down that page. Of course, it would be untruthful. It would be an untruthful to say that Russian propaganda merely invents false narratives. In the case of Ukraine, Russian propaganda has made considerable progress in instigating existing conflicts, hyperbolizing human fears, and masterfully manipulating the mass consciousness of citizens. Yes. The primary goal when spreading propaganda is to weaken a country, reduce its ability to resist Russian aggression, change its foreign policy, and create conditions for the inclusion in its sphere of influence. Yes. I go on to the next page. And it, I'm referring to the second and third paragraphs, which are quite lengthy, but I want to go through them because we've had a discussion uh, previously about how uh, deliberate online falsehoods are used or employed to create a period of tension after which outright hostilities take place. In March of 2014, the, fake, the Stop Fake team noticed an unusually large number of news articles coming from the Kremlin-controlled news sources about the presence of Ukrainian refugees. The narrative was that tens of thousands of Russian-speaking Ukrainian citizens were seeking asylum in Russia as they feared prosecution from the new government. Russian media showed photos and videos of long lines of refugees at the Ukrainian-Russian border allegedly fleeing persecution of the radicals who had come to power in Kiev. The paradox was that there, was, there were absolutely no repressive steps taken by the new Ukrainian government. Yes. In fact, statements from the new government were aimed at reaching an agreement with regions that supported the previous government. Knowing this, the Stop Fake team researched and reviewed the story. Yes. As it turned out, the photographs and videos used by the Russian state media to show fleeing refugees were fake and were actually filmed elsewhere and at entirely different time, particularly from the Ukrainian-Polish border. Yes. When looking further to verify this information, we received official statistics that showed the number of Ukrainian citizens applying for refugee status in Russia has not increased and that such, case, such cases were rare. Yes. Can I confirm where these statistics were from? Uh, it was the first article I uh, wrote for the Stop Fake team, and uh, uh, I personally called to Federal Immigration Service of Russia, and the person from this institution uh, uh, confirmed to me that they had just five uh, phone calls from uh, Ukrainian citizens who asked for information for asylum. Thank you. And I'll continue now. At the same time, an official representative from the Federal Migration Service of Russia in an interview with Stop Fake said that some time ago the company received notice from their political leadership to prepare room for thousands of Ukrainian refugees. Yes. They even began to do so by purchasing mattresses, tents and other equipment. At the same time, the information amazed and confused us. Why prepare places for refugees that did not exist? Yes. We understood the logic of these actions, 
just a month and a half later when in a few Russian-speaking cities in the east, armed men in unidentified military uniforms seized police security services, infrastructure facilities and state authorities. Yes. Later, it turned out that most of these groups were thrown out of Russia and consisted of Russian citizens. In response, the Ukrainian government was forced to launch a so-called anti-terrorist operation. The fighting began with the use of small arms, artillery and aviation. With the development of this armed opposition, there were victims and many were forced to leave their homes. Some of them asked for asylum in Russia. This is when we realized that the Kremlin was plotting the organization of an armed conflict in eastern Ukraine and prepared for the appearance of refugees long before they existed. Yes. Okay. This story has become an important lesson for the Stop Fake team. Since then, it has been our goal to determine the accuracy of reports from Russian government-controlled media. Quite often, the rhetoric of enemy propaganda makes it possible to predict the true intentions of the enemy. Yes. I will go on now, uh, Mr. Dinichenko, to your submission at page 3 on other effective methods of resisting propaganda. And this point is interesting because there would obviously be accusations of uh, censorship and so forth, which you cover in your, in your submission. So I'll go to that part. Within four years, Stop Fake has collected thousands of examples of Russia's purposeful dissemination of fakes and manipulations. Yes. It is extremely important that every article includes detailed facts that clearly show why this information is false. We pay special attention to media organizations who participate in the creation and spread of this information. Yes. Now, yesterday, sir, we had uh, an individual like yourself who was giving evidence before the committee suggest that psychologically people are more inclined towards the fake news and they don't really pay much attention or in psychologically they're not in tune about the, f the, the truth of the matter. And, and how have, has Stop Fake tried to address this problem or has it even been successful in addressing it? Uh, I think, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for invitation and uh, it's honor for me to be here. And to answer your question, uh, I think that our efforts were successful uh, because, first of all, uh, the number of people in Ukraine who fully trust Russian media decreased. Our project and other uh, teams like us, uh, like our team, uh, proved that Russian state media, Russian media, uh, this disseminate not facts, not news, but propaganda. So. All this evidence that we collected, you mentioned thousands of articles, uh, we were, uh, it helped us to prove that this is not media, this is a propaganda machine, and this is the extension of Russian foreign policy, and it played a crucial role, a role in uh, creating this conflict in eastern Ukraine and annexation of Crimea. So. Uh, the uh, recent uh, polls show that three to five percent of Ukrainians fully trust Russian media. This is one of the achievements of our project, and I believe uh, th that's why our work was very important. Another uh, thing that we uh, managed to reach is a huge massive of evidence. Russian officials, uh, they like to ask, where is the evidence that uh, we poisoned this person. Uh, and when they ask, where is the evidence that we use propaganda for, for our, uh, in our media, we can present the folder full of articles with, uh, where we step by step explain uh, what was wrong and why it's not true. So uh, for us, it was an es essential part of um, measures to uh, to resist Russian propaganda efforts, but of course it's not the only one thing that must be done to, to protect people from uh, being influenced by foreign propaganda or any kind of propaganda. I will move on now to the fourth page of your submission on new challenges. And uh, you spoke uh, quite despondently, I would say, at the beginning when you said, unfortunately, even after four years of all our work, Russian propaganda persists in Ukrainian society, constantly adapting to new measures implemented <coughs> excuse me, by Ukraine and its allies. 
not only has it not disappeared, but it has become more sophisticated and professional. And you identify trends thereafter, uh, including television transmitters to uh, overcome uh, uh, television channels which have been yeah. barred or banned. Uh, you refer to the substitution of daily news with political talk shows and hired actors to ostensibly create yes. a narrative. But the third uh, point you raise, I beg your pardon, the fourth uh, bullet point covers bots and the use of bots. And interestingly, these bots, uh, they don't speak from a pro-Russian standpoint, but ironically, they speak from an ultra-patriotic Ukrainian standpoint. It shows a certain level of sophistication in, in, in the propaganda. My question is, what is the solution that StopFake has considered with regard to bots? Mm -hmm. uh, has there been any discussions within your team to address this uh, potential and that of artificial intelligence, which appears to be the direction where um, the, this whole uh, fake news machine appears to be heading towards? Mm -hmm. uh, we have a small team of people who voluntarily donate their time to, uh, to this project. And our focus is uh, Russian state media. Uh, these Russian uh, bots and bot networks, they are not our primary goal. But uh, still, when we discover these networks with a huge number of bots that uh, were created either by computers or uh, people and uh, people who write the comments and who uh, disseminate different kind of information and disinformation about Ukraine, uh, it, uh, it becomes uh, obvious that this is not Ukrainian patriotic uh, people, citizens who want uh, to do something for their country, but this is enemy who paid to create these networks to make our country weaker and to, uh, to do some harm to our country. So when we discover these networks, when we, when we can uh, find evidence that this is uh, foreign country sponsored networks, uh, they become not so influential and uh, uh, no one trusts them. But unfortunately, we don't have enough resources to counter exact this, uh, uh, these measures because it requires a lot of uh, computer science knowledge, knowledge we don't have at our team, we don't have it. We are a group of journalists and we concentrate our efforts on uh, Russian state media. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dinichenko. Just to clarify, uh, the committee is not taking a position or supporting either Ukraine or Russia in this matter. We're taking our interest is on deliberate online falsehoods and our terms of reference. Yes, I understand. Uh, thank you. I've uh, finished the questions I have, and I'll direct the mic to, to the chair. Uh, Mr. Xia Kenping. Mr. Devinchenko, uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, so just going through what, uh, besides Mr. Singh has gone through the report, there are a few other things which I would also like to highlight for record. Uh, going back to page one, uh, the last para, uh, as you describe how the Russians, um, uh, the various tactics that they do, it, this creates situation, conditions for a country to come within Russia's sphere of influence, right? Yes. And in that same para, you say that uh, the Russian propaganda can instigate existing conflicts, can exaggerate fears, and manipulate the mass consciousness of the citizens. And you gave an example of how this Ru Russian disinformation has translated into armed conflict, which is the conflict in eastern Ukraine, correct? Yes. yes. Um, and page two, the second para, um, I, I, you describe how Russia weaponized, you use the word weaponized, disinformation in order to organize an armed conflict. Yes. And then this led to some of the things which uh, Mr. Singh had elaborated earlier. The various count countermeasures uh, that you proposed, uh, this is in page three, um, the last para, um, you highlighted that the initial, the, the, or rather, rather the decision to ban Russian TV was initially viewed as being undemocratic 
and was labelled as censorship. But through your team's work, uh, I think you were able to convince many that it is not about censorship, but about countering Russia's information war in Ukraine. Yes. Correct? So this, this process of gathering inf evidence to conclusively prove these findings must have been a very painstaking, a very time-consuming one, right? Yes, that's true. And this gets repeated for each series of misinformation. Would yes. this be the case? Yes. So do you, do you, is this a very sustainable way of doing it? Because I can imagine that you know, the work involved just is amplified many times over. Uh, and the resources that's required. Yes, of course. And uh, uh, we started as a volunteer project and uh, later uh, some organizations approached us and offered their, their help. So uh, we are transparent with uh, and we put all the information about uh, people and organizations who support us, support our, our team on our website. We, we, we think that transparency is a key to trust. And uh, for us, trust is number one issue. And by the way, that is why we, uh, we do not have connection with the government and we do not have uh, government money because we do not uh, to be perceived as the Ukrainian government propaganda against Russian government propaganda. We consider ourselves as a journalistic independent project. Uh, that's why we, we do not depend on the government. And, and overall, you recommend that besides the work that you do, that the, the countermeasures need to involve many other stakeholders. It has to be a multi-pronged approach. Yes. Okay. Chairman, that's all. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Shamuga. Thank you, Mr. Denchenko. Can I refer you to... Let me try and number your pages. Uh, mm. First, the third page, under other effective methods of resisting propaganda, you have that? Uh, which paragraph? The last two paragraphs. Okay. It's on the screen as well. Okay. Within four years, Stop Fake has collected thousands of examples of Russia's purposeful dissemination of fakes and manipulations. It is extremely important that every article includes detailed facts that clearly show why this information is false. And you say that allowed you to firmly accuse specific television channels, radio stations, newspapers. So you identified television channels, radio stations, newspapers of actively participating in circulating propaganda, yes. correct? Yes. That evidence then allowed the state to go and ban these channels, newspapers, and uh, radio stations. Yes. That's state action. Uh, yes. Thank the you. government go went to the, to the court and the court banned these TV channels. Right. So that was a formidable blow to Russian propaganda because the source of propaganda was cut off. Yes. That then allowed you and others to put out the truth more effectively. Yes. So your experience shows that it's extremely important to intervene and stop the propaganda in the first place. Yes, that's correct. And. Nevertheless, despite the problems you faced, your European officials considered this decision to ban Russian television, which was beaming propaganda into your country, as undemocratic and called it censorship. Yes. But that is, a, I suppose, a philosophical position that some European officials take. Regardless of what happens, you must not do anything. Uh by the way, it was one of our achievements that we raised awareness about this issue, not just in Ukraine, but in European countries. I understand, countries. but yes. prior to you raising the issue, yes. they come from the perspective that regardless of what kind of attack, however your state is being attacked, and uh, how much damage you suffer, there's a certain philosophical approach that they take that there should be no uh, censorship. Yes. You ignored it and you shut down these channels. Yes. Now, um, but after you did it, and looking at your experience, and looking at the next sentence, evidence compiled by you convinced, I suppose many, probably not all, that this was not censorship, but rather about countering the informational war. Info 
informational wall in Ukraine, yes. correct? Yes. But I suspect you didn't convince all of them. Of course not. Right. Um, and you say in the third paragraph that Ukraine's resistance to Russian propaganda is also empowered by international support. Uh, so after a while, your actions began to get international support. Yes. Right. You consider your stance, this way you responded, to be a very powerful stance against a foreign attempt to destabilize your country. Yes. That then forced them to change their strategies. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dinijenko. Um, my question is regarding um, to the cultural aspects. I'd like to inquire, based on your experience, how has culture or knowledge of local culture enabled a foreign aggressor to more easily influence a local population uh, to its worldview and to lessen their will to fight back should a foreign aggressor take on even more aggressive tactics? Thank you for your question. Um, Ukraine is a multinational and multi-language uh, country. So we have a, a huge proportion of Russian-speaking people. And it was one of the uh, crucial uh, elements of why Russian propaganda in Ukraine was so successful. Uh, in 2014, uh, at least three Russian government financed uh, TV networks were among top 10 uh, TV networks in Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainian government and Ukraine didn't pay attention to the influence of these TV networks, and they worked, Russian networks worked in Ukraine for years. They influenced people, and they uh, have, uh, they had a lot of uh, supporters of their ideas. Uh, unfortunately, this ignorance of, uh, of this threat uh, costed our country too much. Uh, the part of our country were, uh, was uh, illegally annex annexed by, by Russia, Crimean pen Peninsula, and uh, the another Russian-speaking region, uh, Donbass, uh, Russia sent its uh, uh, so-called green man troops, un unidentified uh, military men with, uh, with machine guns, with heavy weapons. So 10,000 people lost their lives. So my answer will be that uh, very often uh, propaganda, Russian propaganda, does not create conflict. They look for a potential conflict uh, between Russian-speaking and Ukrainian-speaking Ukrainians, uh, between uh, uh, Ukraine in its neighbors, like Polish men, uh, po uh, po Poland and Ukraine, Ukrainians, uh, they look for uh, examples in the in the in the past. Uh, they look for information that might uh, split the country, split the 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 culture cultural segments of of the country, and they work to fuel this conflict between people. So they achieved, uh, they are very successful in, in, in this. And uh, unfortunately, as I mentioned, they, they use these uh, differences between uh, people uh, to fuel these, these conflicts. Okay, just to help me understand this more. Mm -hmm. So it goes beyond just common language. You, you say that you go back to the past, there could be historical incidents, historical events that they, that they use as well yes. to cultivate that... Um, so-called common understanding, mm -hmm. and to leverage on that to, to split the nation according to certain lines of thought that exist in society. That's what you're saying? That's correct. And yeah, this so could go, you, you quoted the example of using um, TV networks, but it can go beyond that, right? Mm -hmm. I would yes, assume. Yes. So this could be through the form of videos online, and what other um, methods could you see could be employed? In such a strategy. Yeah, I can mention another example. By the way, it was an example when our uh, project uh, was able to predict future events. Uh, uh, we have noticed, monitoring Russian media, we have noticed that they put a lot of information about uh, Ukraine and Poland uh, relations in the past. Uh, 
and uh, about our conflicts, about that uh, during the Second World War, some Ukrainians in some cities killed Polish people and some Polish people killed Ukrainians. So we just noticed that the number and the, the quality of content just raised significantly. So for us, it, it means something. And we predicted that we're going to expect something to happen. And uh, of course, uh, several weeks later, we saw that uh, radicals in Poland and radicals in Ukraine started to do some uh, things to, for example, they start to burn, uh, uh, radicals in Ukraine started to burn uh, Polish flags. Radicals in Poland started to burn uh, Ukrainian flags, destroy Ukrainians' uh, graves. Uh, so, and later, uh, some emails leaks from uh, uh, from uh, Russian institutions demonstrated that all these events were organized uh, and paid by Russian by, by Russia, basically. So, uh, very often you can predict what what's going to happen when you when you watch Russian television. Um, Mr. Denishenko, thank you for sharing with us the Ukrainian experience. Um, I also would like to hear a little bit more about the positive alternative agenda that you referred to in the last bullet point of your submission. Um, I do understand that you use radio and TV and so on, uh, but also um, perhaps a little bit more about how you use the uh, online platforms and social media. Um, I understand you also did say that in your organization you're mostly uh, co compute, uh, journalists and not uh, te technology experts. But right. uh, in general, what is the Ukrainian approach uh, when it comes to social media? And also, how do you rally uh, representatives of non-government organizations, activists, and youth uh, to take part in this holistic uh, program or agenda? Thank you for your questions. Uh, our organization managed to do several things to reach different segments of the audience of Ukrainians, of Ukrainian citizens. Uh, for example, we produce three weekly TV shows uh, in English, in Ukrainian, and in Russian for different segments of, uh, of the audience. We produce a weekly radio show uh, in, in Russian language. We produce monthly newspaper. Uh, and also, uh, so we uh, recently we, we, we launched a project with the Ministry of Education uh, where we want to uh, implement critical thinking in uh, in schools so children uh, at schools will have uh, information that will help them critically uh, think and consume information from social networks from uh, from media uh, we are just at the beginning of this process we launched this project just uh, uh, a month ago so we start a uh, uh, thinking pr uh, process, uh, but uh, we hope the, that we, we will be able to implement the, uh, the elements of, uh, of these uh, classes to, since the 1st of September. So this is uh, just several things that we do in Ukraine to, uh, to help as, as I said, different segments of the audience, older people, uh, Russian speaking, Ukrainian speaking, youth, uh, to to be more uh, kind of resistant to 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 the potential threats from from social media, from uh, from media. Currently, how many uh, persons are there in your organization, journalists and? Well, other we have uh, 30 people in our team. Uh, they are not all, not all of them are full-time uh, employees. We have full-time employees, but most of, of people, they, they are part-time employees and work for, uh, for different projects. And how are you funded? Uh, most of funding right now we receive from the British Embassy in, uh, in Ukraine. 
and also some funding we, we get from, uh, from private donations. Okay. Thank but you. all this information, as I said, on our website, mm -hmm. so we, we, with the full description. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Denichenko, for the information. Like Ms. Uh, Chai, I was also curious as to your organization, because you started off as a volunteer project, and now you've developed into the organization that you are. So um, maybe a bit of insight of how that grew and what was the motiv motivating factor that um, built that team. Um, what, are, what are the sort of steps that you put in place to make sure that the organization works? And, you know, at the end of your um, submission, you also raised the issue of how it appears to be, you know, every time you do something, there's always new developments on the side of the Russian propaganda. I'm wondering if that is something that um, takes a hit on the organization, and whether the organization as a whole feels demoralized, and in what way and what efforts can be put in place to actually uh, get ahead of the game, you know? Um, how can you work as a team, and um, what are the things that you can do to preempt certain things? You've mentioned some of the efforts that you've put in place, um, but are there ways, because you mentioned your limitations in terms of resources, is there any plan to expand? Um, is there any plan to, you know, build the team further? Engagement and collaborations with other organisations. Um, what is the um, sort of um, future for this organisation and what you hope to do? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your question. Uh, our our project it was an idea of. Uh, uh, professors, students, and alumni of the School of Journalism in Kiev. So it was uh, just an idea that we need to do something. So uh, some somebody put some uh, information on on the Facebook. Hey guys, let's get together and let's decide what to do. So it was the 1st of March 2014, and the very next day we created a website and uh, started to to fool it with the information, uh, and, uh, and the, yeah, by the way, the, the, uh, the, the, the second day, uh, when we just put the website online, we, we had a huge uh, attack of uh, bot and DDoS attack on our website, so we, we had to change the, uh, the internet provider to, to find a uh, more reliable uh, hosting for our, for our website. And uh, we, uh, we hear a lot about ourselves and about uh, members of our team, about our project from, from our counterparts uh, from Russia. Uh, I read a, a lot of articles uh, about ourselves and about our funding. And uh, I remember that uh, one of the uh, columnists in uh, in Russian uh, website newspaper, web newspaper, wrote that, oh, some hackers got information that uh, uh, they hacked uh, George Soros's uh, private email, and they have found that George Soros sponsors Stop Fake. And we answered that you don't need to, to hack somebody's email because all this information on our website. So we are transparent with that. And uh, George Soros uh, sponsored uh, our, uh, uh, some of our activities, uh, translation to different languages. And we just put this information on the website. And uh, so it was not a sen sen sensation. Uh, in sense of uh, uh, future plans, uh, we, we constantly working on uh, improving our activities to find uh, uh, a response to new threats, to new ideas that Russian propaganda uh, invents. They are, very, uh, uh, they, they are very flexible, they are very talented people, by the way. So they invent all the time, they invent, invent something new. And uh, so, but we think that Media literacy uh, projects, uh, it's, uh, it's one of the uh, directions where we, we would like to develop uh, our project. Uh, we, uh, by the way, we, we shared uh, professors from uh, different Ukrainian universities and we helped them to, uh, to implement our knowledge, our skills and to, to their curriculums. Uh, we provided them with, with, with our expertise, so a lot of uh, university professors in different school of journalism in Ukraine, now they teach and use our examples in their 
uh, when they teach future journalists. So they use how to do fact checking, how to check information online and so on. Uh, and uh, so our experience shows that when we have idea, when we have, uh, when we start to do something, we all, you can always find uh, support. You can always find partners who uh, who can support your your activity. Yeah, but uh, yeah, one last thing I would like to mention that uh, the only one uh, idea that n not only one, but one idea I'm, uh, I'm uh, I have. I trust in that you cannot ignore this problem. You cannot ignore existing of propaganda because uh, Ukraine did it for 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 years, and uh, it might happen with uh, with any country that one day you can wake up in look in the window and see uh, people with machine guns guns who kill each other because they somebody on TV persuaded them that, that they should hate each other. And uh, our experience, again, demonstrated that uh, this is a powerful weapon and it could be pointed to any, any country anytime very, very quickly. Like in case of Turkey, when Turkish president and, uh, uh, and president of Russia, Putin, then uh, they were enemy. Russian propaganda started to use all the, all the approaches, all the uh, expertise they have uh, with, with Ukraine, they started to use against Turkey. So they started to, to write that uh, Turkey has uh, uh, connections with ISIS, Turkish president sells uh, drugs, and uh, his family is involved in, the, uh, in illegal weapon trade. And after Putin and uh, Erdogan shake their hands, all these reports, they just disappeared from, from Russian press. And again, Ukraine became number one enemy of, of Russian uh, media. Okay, if there are no more questions, Mr. Denichenko, thank you very much for thank being so present much. here and for your contributions. We'll be sending you a transcript of today's proceedings. If there's any amendments, please send it back to us. Sir. Thank, thank you. So you. We really appreciate your coming all the way for this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, salut arms. Okay, I propose we take a lunch break now and I suspend the meeting and we will resume our proceedings at 1 p.m. Thank you.